question as we begin this morning is, why did you come to church? Why do you come to church? Why do you go to church? Why did you come to church on this particular Sunday today? Was it because of friends? Was it because of your wife? Was it because of your mom? Was it because of your daughter? Was it because of, uh, of, of, of the donuts, the free coffee? Was it because of you just needed a place to go where you could see people? And why did you come to church? Was it because you wanted to hear the sermon? Was it the music that brought you here? Was it because you have been taught that church is important for you to be a moral person? Why is it that you came to church? And the thing about it is that we love to discuss scripture, to argue doctrine, to debate interpretations, to fight over dogma, to, to philosophically have an exchange. I'll tell you this right now. From my perspective, after preaching the gospel for several years, what I've discovered is that most people come to church to argue with me. To sit in the pew and, and, and literally sit there and say, let me see if I agree with his teaching. Let me see if what he's saying matches up with what I've understood for years. Let me see if I, I can validate or justify how I'm thinking based on what he's saying. Or maybe you came to church because you know that you're a Bible thumper and you just need to get more ammo. Oh, come on, it's an election year, guys. It's an election year. You need something from the word to fight the Democrats on the internet. You evangelicals, you. <laughs> and Beth's like, yeah. Huh? We want ammo. And, and so, like, the, the question becomes, why do, we come to Je- why do we come to Jesus? Jesus is a good guy, so we should become more like him. And so maybe we should go to church so we can learn about what Jesus is like. Today's passage, we're going to read about a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. He comes to Jesus by night uh, to find out who Jesus was. He was a ruler. He was an intelligent man. He knew the scriptures. He sang the scriptures. He memorized the scriptures. He had authority amongst the ranks of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, what you need to understand about the Pharisees is that there were only 6,000 Pharisees at any given time. It was a small sect, but they were the ones who held the doctrine. They were the conservatives, the ones who had a grip on Scripture and right living. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees literally had 60 volumes that interpreted the law. 60 volumes. To teach people how to, to, to live up to the Torah, how to interpret scripture, how to, how to keep the Sabbath, how to, how to eat the proper foods, how to live right so that God can find you acceptable so you may inherit, that you may earn God's kingdom. But here is Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus to know who Jesus really is. And so we'll read the scriptures. In John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. A what? A ruler of the Jews. So speaking about his, his status, he was a Pharisee and he was a ruler of the Jews. He had esteem. He had he was a person of distinction. He was an influencer. He was a leader. This man came to Jesus by night. By what? By night, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. We know that you are a teacher sent by God, come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. I'm going to just pause right there. Because this is what Nicodemus comes to Jesus with. The same way that most Calvary Chapel Baptist hostile people come to Jesus. I already know who you are. I've been studying you. I have my doctrine right. I'm Calvinist, Arianist, whatever it is, isms. 
and you come to God with this lofty idea and sense of who you are. We know. We figured you out. We've put you in a box. We understand you. We know our doctrine. We know our prophecy. We know our end time uh, eschatology. We know all these things. And so we're going to, we, 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 we just want to validate you for what we've already come to understand about you. And so Jesus responds. Watch the response. You ready for it? Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But, but most of us were taught that Nicodemus came and said, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? What must I do to be saved? That's not what Nicodemus said. Nicodemus basically came to Jesus with a knowledge base. We know that you're a teacher come from God. We know because no one can do the signs that you're doing. Now, I want to go back real quick to uh, John chapter 2, verse 23, because the thing about Scripture is that Scripture was not written in chapter and verse division. Okay? Some of the thoughts that we take apart and, and we memorize one section are part of a larger context. And so if you don't understand the larger context, you don't understand the full meaning of what God is trying to give to us through his teaching. So in John chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. They did what? They believed in his name, which we learned last week was the purpose of why he came, so that many would believe in his name. And so at that point, you're, you're thinking to yourself, we should worship, we should praise God, because he has accomplished that which he came to do, to, so that people can believe in his name. When they saw, when they saw what? The signs that he was doing. However, watch what Jesus does. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And needed no one to bear witness about man, for he knew what was in man. So what's happening here is that Jesus is like, listen, they believe in my name, but their hearts are, are, are dirty. Their hearts are unclean. Their hearts are, are deceitful. They, they have not experienced transformation. They, they have a knowledge. They have a, they've seen works. They've seen wonders. They've seen miracles. But they have not seen a transformational change on the inside of them. So Nicodemus who also has seen the signs, has also a perception of who Jesus is, comes by night in darkness and says, we know that you're a teacher. A what? Does he say the teacher? He says a teacher from God. For no one could do these signs. I've seen the signs. Just like the others who have believed in you, I've seen the signs, and I see that nobody can perform these things unless God is with him. And what I want to submit to you is that you, my friends, are Nicodemus. You're interested in Jesus. You're curious about him. You're a good person. You're open-minded. You're willing to learn. But just like Nicodemus, we come in darkness. We come in what? Some of us have come because we want to know. We're curious. We want to know about Jesus. And some of us... Know Jesus, and we have, we've come here to be reminded about what we know, reminded about what he's done. And one problem with Nicodemus is that he's spiritually blind, he comes by, by night, he came in darkness, he comes in blindness, and he needs new eyes. He needs what? Why do I know that? Because the next verse that Jesus says, he says, uh, no one can see. You're seeing me in one way. But others have seen me completely differently. You see me in one way, but you, 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 you need to see me in a different way. He says, uh, he, he, he doesn't come out outright and just say, you know, uh, who, who are you really? Uh, what box can I put you in? He, instead, he, uh, what Jesus does is that he calls Nicodemus out in order to call him in. He's like, you've got it all wrong, Nicodemus. You don't know what you're talking about. You think you're in because you're a Jew. You think you're in because you're a Pharisee. You think you're in because you're a ruler of the Jews. You think you're in because you're a teacher. You think you're in because you have position. You think you're in because you have influence. And what Jesus literally says is probably the worst insult you can give to a person. You need to unalive yourself and be born again. You need to start all over. You have to be born again. Uh, uh, and think about the statement. What, what Jesus is saying is that you're not special. You're not cute. 
You're not, you're not humorous. You're not, you don't have a, 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 a witty sense. You, you, your humor sucks. Your, your works mean nothing. Your trophies are meaningless. Everything that you've done up until this point is nothing. You need to start all over, Nicodemus. Erase everything that you know about yourself and start all over. And this right here, I want to tell you, is the most ridiculous part of Scripture ever. It's, it's the hardest part of Scripture to understand. We, 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 we throw it around because we've been hearing about being born again all our life. Like, you got to be born again. You got to be born again. You know, you, you got to be born again. You want to see God? You got to be born again. No one sees God unless they're, they're born again. What does it mean? What does it really mean? Who, who can really, really put a finger on what that truly, truly means? Nicodemus is a teacher in Israel. He is a person who's learned. He's memorized scripture. He sings scripture. He has entire books of the Old Testament completely in his memory bank. And he doesn't understand. Why? Because being born again is biologically impossible. Are y'all with me? It's biologically impossible. It's not natural. The term being born again became popular more recently. In the 1960s during the Jesus movement, that's when it became very, very popular. As a matter of fact, in some circles, being called a born again was an insult. Oh, you're one of those born agains. You didn't want to be a born again. You didn't want to be identified as a born again. And in the Jesus movement, they made a distinction between those who were Christian only in name versus those who had had a profound experience with God. I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, and in my context, being born again meant that you were baptized. And they pulled it from this passage because Jesus talks about water, he talks about the Spirit. So when someone says, are you born again? say, yes, I was baptized on January 27, 1993. I accepted the Lord, and I was born again. Uh, look, look at that. Look how I said that. I accepted the Lord. I made it. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Come on, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Millennials are like, what song is this? I did something. This passage, like I said, is connected to John chapter 2, 23 through 25. Jesus is saying there's something about man's heart that is a problem. Nicodemus, just like the many who believed in his name, have not experienced a transformation. They've seen miracles. They've seen signs. They've seen all these things, but they don't know who Jesus is. And so what Nicodemus comes and says to Jesus is he gives Jesus a spiritual appraisal. We know. Who's we? We had a council meeting. Our committee got together. We, we, we went through the Old Testament and all the prophets and the law, and we looked at your miracles and your signs, and we came to a decision. You are a teacher come from God. Congratulations. We accept you. Now, if you'll only vote the way that we vote, if you'll only do the things that we say you should do, you can have full rights to be fully accepted. You'll be invited to our, to our dinners and our conventions, and, and you, maybe you might be a conference speaker. So, what did Nicodemus say to Jesus? Pop quiz. We know that you are a rabbi. a rabbi, a teacher, come from God. Now let's go back a little bit. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, what did he say? Behold, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. If I was to say a teacher come from God versus behold, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, one of those is greater than the other. Are you with me? One of them is a perception that sees that this is not just some ordinary dude. So Negro Demas, you need to change your thinking. Oh, did I say, oh, sorry. My bad. I need to be saved. <laughs> you 
Nathaniel is sitting under a tree. When, 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 when his friend comes over and says, come and see this teacher. And so he says, can anything good come out of, uh, out of Nazareth? And so when he approaches Jesus, he says, I saw you. There comes a man in whom there is no deceit. And so he says, I saw you. And when Nathaniel hears this from Jesus, what does Nathaniel say? He says, you are truly the son of God, the king of Israel. Son of God, king of Israel versus a teacher come from God. Because of signs. Which one is greater? Who is seeing Jesus completely different than the other? One of these things belongs together. Whatever the song goes. You remember the song, right? One of the, not like the other. Now it's time to play our game. So what Jesus is saying is that, like, listen, I'm going to confirm the lack of vision that you have. I'm going to confirm that the vision that you have of me is faulty. And unless you are born again, you cannot see me. Unless you are, you are born, and really, the, the, the text says born again, right? Is that what it says? Um, uh, translators have a problem with words that they can't put into English. A proper translation there is it should be more unless you are born from above. You cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Unless you're born from above, you cannot see. It's not about, and, and because it, that's where we get tripped up, like, oh, I got to be born again. No, no, it's unless you are born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying that, yes, you, you've seen miracles, but you haven't seen anything about me. You've seen, you've seen me teach. You've heard my, my, my parables. You've heard my analogies, my metaphors, and, and all these things. I've got bars, and you can, you can recognize that. However, you're not seeing the true essence of who I am and what I can do in your life. You haven't seen the kingdom of God. You don't have new eyes. And you only get those new eyes by being born from above. So let's go to verse 4 and 8. He says this, says, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, the thing about what, what's happening there is that Nicodemus is, is, is a literalist. He's a ph Pharisee, and Pharisees were literalists. And so he's perceiving what Jesus is saying from a very literal, physical perspective. How can I crawl back up into my mother's womb and be birthed again? I am a man that is old. Can't you see? And so what Jesus does, he goes deeper and he clarifies. Born again is to be born of water and the spirit. And he repeats it in verse 6. He says, spirit begets spirit. Spiritual births spiritual. Are you with me? Like begets like. Physical births physical. Spiritual births spiritual. Are y'all with me? Okay. So what's happening is this. Let's, let's, let's do this, right? Um, uh, because y'all don't know the word. You, you don't know the word. And I know you came to church to hear Joel Osteen encourage you, but y'all you, don't know the word. You don't know the word. But what you do know is this. It was all a dream. Started... Here's a little something about it, like me. Never should have been let out. I wish I was a little bit. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let, let's bring it in for everybody, you know. Sweet home. Huh? Hit me, baby. What's that? Who is this boy? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> if I call out certain words, you already know the entire song. Are you with me? If, if I just drop a couple of lyrics of something that you already know, you have a reference point. So what Jesus has done here is that he's given Nicodemus a reference point that only Nicodemus can understand. Because when we read what is, uh, uh, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit, we're like, 
Of course. Glory to, you know, what is born of flesh is flesh and what's spirit is spirit, praise the Lord, as Greg Laurie has said. We have no context whatsoever. So I, I, here, here's what I want to do, okay? I want to do this. I, I want to go back to John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. Okay, let's go back to John 23, 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believing in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So they're seeing things, right? And Jesus is looking where? But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he knew himself what was in man. In. And last week we talked about how God looks on the Right? And he searches your heart. He looks on what's happening on the heart. And he knows what you're going to say before you utter a word. He knows what you think before you've thought it. Before you were even a thought in your parents' mind. Before your parents got together and did the thing. God knew you and he knew all your ways. He's acquainted with how you lay down. Where you you can't escape his presence. He knows everything about you. And so when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he's like, I know you, bro. You're coming here all smart, but I've already figured you out. I figured it out, and I'm going to speak to you in a language that you're going to understand. You must be born again. You must be born of above. And he says, how can I be born again? Ha, I know. I knew you were going to say that. And so I'm going to give you a callback. It was all a dream. <laughs> Word Up Magazine. Okay, all right. And so he says, you must be born of spirit. And of, let's go back to verse 4, John chapter 3, verse 4. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Go to the next verse. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Next verse. Um, uh, the wind blows where it wishes, and, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak, we. You came to me and said, we know that you are a man, a teacher sent from God. So now Jesus turns it around on him and says, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you of earthly things, you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So what Jesus has done is that he's literally given him a reference point. And the reference point is Ezekiel chapter 35. 36, I'm sorry. The issues of the heart. In Ezekiel 36 verse 24, it says this. Y'all gonna read with me? I want you to emphasize every time he gets to I. You with me? Let's practice. I. I. Okay, whenever he gets to I, I want you to be like, I, all right? Get gully with it. That was, that was not gully. Let's try it one more time. All right, cool. Here we go. One, two, three. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. We'll sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols. We'll cleanse you and will give you a new heart, a new spirit, will put within you and will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and your God. I will sprinkle clean water on you. I'll give you a new spirit. I'll put my spirit within you. I will wash. Who's going to do the washing? I will wash you. I will cleanse you. I'll provide the water. Hello, somebody. I'll bring the soap. I'm the one who's going to do it. Are you all with me this morning? 
I will perform surgery. I will give you a new heart. I'll remove the stony heart and give you a new heart. I'll put a heart of flesh in you. I will put my own spirit on the inside of you and cause you to walk my way. In other words, I'm going to give you new eyes. I'm going to give you a new heart. And I'm going to give you new feet. Because the ones that you were born with cannot walk in my way. The heart you were born with cannot receive me. The eyes that were given to you at birth cannot see me. You'll only see me in a physical sense. And so this whole thing requires I doing it. Who's the star of the whole thing? Who's the, who's the, the producer, executive producer, star, co-star? Where do you fit in the picture? What do you do? What, what part do you get to play in it? It's all God. He will do those things. He will move. He will act. He will save. He will give you life. What Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is being born in the right Christian country doesn't get you saved. The right ethnic identity does not get you saved. Every religion on this planet is ethnocentric. If you're a Mexican, you are... Hey, hello, somebody. If you're an Arab, you are... If you're Indian, you are... And if you're Jewish, you are... Oh, there we go. That was a trick. Ethnic identity doesn't save you. And furthermore, a knowledge and an appraisal of what you think about God does not save you. It's not your will. It's a matter of God's spirit. How do we know this? It's a matter of God's spirit. Why? Because spirit is also equal to the wind. Are you with me? The wind, the pneuma. And so it says that uh, the wind blows. Where it comes from, there's not one meteorologist that can tell you where the wind's coming from. All we get to experience is the effect of the wind. Are y'all with me? We see the effects of transformation. We see the effects of a transformed life. God will blow on who he wishes to when he wishes to, how he wishes to. It doesn't work according to your expectations and your efforts. And John has already said this in John chapter 1. Because this is what he said. He says, but to all who did receive him, to all who did what? Receive him. Who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And Nicodemus should understand this, but he doesn't. So look at verse 9. He says, how? 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 The problem with your Christian walk is you're stuck on how. How? How? Moses, go and tell my people. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. How? How? Mary, behold, you're found to be with child, and, and he shall be the, the king of the Jews, and he shall uh, deliver the people. And, and the angel comes to, the, to Mary, a little uh, uh, teenage girl, and says, these are the things that are going to happen to you. And, and what does she say to the angel? How? How? Since I am a virgin. How? Most of us are stuck on how with God. And God's like, it's never about how. It's always about who. Who? Who does it? Who saves? Who delivers? Who cleanses? Who washes? Who performs surgery? Who gives you the new heart? Who gives you a heart of flesh and takes away the heart of stone? Who performs all these things? It's not how does it happen. It's who does it. 
Who does it? So Jesus is saying, you think you've got this religion thing cornered? You think you know what you're talking about because you know a few verses about this eschatology and about Nephilim and stuff? You think just because you went to Bible college, you, 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 you got something? Just because you went to Sunday school? Just because you pray before you have a happy meal? You don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get it. So here's, here's what Jesus says. Are you the teacher of Israel and yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, you came to me with we know that you are a teacher. And so Jesus turns it around. We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one, everyone say no one, no one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And now we're more confused than we were before. You don't get it. The Word, who was the Word in the beginning, the Word who was with God, the Word that is God, that Word only understands because He's the one who's descended from heaven. We speak of what we know. Who's we? I, Jesus, the Father, the Spirit, and those who have come to see me as who I really am. Speak of what we've known and what we have seen through spiritual eyes because we, oh man, I feel like preaching right now. I'm not from Nazareth. I'm the one who came from heaven. The mystery of the gospel is that it is not born of human origin. A couple months ago, Ramadan was ending and I... I I have a, one of my best friends is, is, is a Muslim, and uh, we were discussing, we, we love to talk about religion. I mean, it's one of the f funnest conversations we have. And Ramadan is a special time. I'm like, I, I wish there was a Christian Ramadan. It's only one day, though. They do 40 days of fasting and prayer and, and, and just like in the, and like he was going to mosque twice a day and and we were having these discussions. And so he's talking to me about, about uh, you know, Islam. And, and I have a background in Islam myself because, you know, every person who grew up in the 90s and listened to Public Enemy, you know, Malcolm X, all that, you know. So, so I can understand. I've read the Quran. And so we're going back and forth. And I, and I love to show him how in Scripture it says this. And, and we go back and forth. And. And, 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 and so he's like, but I still don't, he's like, and he, can I say something that's going to be a little bit controversial to you all? Is it okay if I say something that's going to mess you up a little bit? Can I say something that's going to mess you up a little bit? You, you, I might get canceled after saying this. I might get canceled about, uh, after saying this. So we're talking about the Palestinian thing that's happening in Israel and all that kind of stuff. We're going back and forth. And here's what I want to tell you, evangelical Christians. Islam is closer to Christianity than, than Judaism. Islam is... Muslims respect Jesus. Jews hate him. At least they say he's a master prophet. So we're connecting on those things. And I'm like, he's not just a prophet, bro. He's not just a teacher. He's not like Muhammad. He is the son of God. He's like, yeah, we, we believe in Mary. We believe in this. And I'm like, no, no, no. He's something more. And as we're talking, as we're talking, I realize something. Christians can't convince those who cannot see. The miracle of the gospel is that we cannot convince. I know, and, and, and sometimes people have asked me, like, Pastor, how come you don't do altar calls? You want to know why I don't do altar calls? I do altar calls. 
but I have this love-hate relationship with altar calls because I'm a salesman. I know how to close. I know how to get people to repeat a prayer. Did you have a bad week? Repeat this prayer after me. Play the music. The mystery of the gospel is that it's not born of man. It is born of a higher dimensional being. Let me say that again. It is born of a higher dimensional plane, dimensional being. It is caused by someone, something bigger than what we see on this earthly plane. You cannot make this up. You cannot figure it out. You cannot put it in a box. You cannot even participate in it. You have to release yourself to it. You need new eyes. You need a new heart. You need new feet to receive the testimony of Jesus. He has to wake you up to his testimony. It's not something that you can understand by, by studying. It's something that he has to illuminate and breathe into your life. So let's consider what we've learned so far about this idea of being born again or being born from above. It is a spiritual birth, amen? And that spiritual birth is what is necessary to recognize, to receive, and to enter the kingdom of God. It is also a work of his spirit, not of me and not of you. Are we, are we together so far? Just like not a single one of you said to your mama, I'd like to be born. There's not a single human being that chose when their birth date was. I did not somehow say, you know what, on July 28, 1976, I would like to come into this world. The same way, you cannot make yourself born again. When Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you must be born again, he's not putting the burden of birth on him. Religious people who don't understand scripture will always make it about you. I surrender all. I decide. I do not go there. You cannot birth yourself. You cannot birth yourself. Physically, you cannot birth yourself. Spiritually, you cannot birth yourself. And that's why it's bad news for a human. That's why it's bad news. The gospel is good news, but you must be acquainted with the bad news first. If you don't understand the bad news, it's not good news. That's why we don't worship God. That's why we don't get... I sent a few of my friends a video of a man dancing in church. I love, I, I love watching white Pentecostals. It's my favorite pastime. Because white Pentecostals act black, y'all. I mean, just saying, it's like. <laughs> so I sent this video to Pastor Scott. I was like, next time we're in church, this is what I want you doing. If I don't see you doing this, I don't believe you're saved. The guy was rolling around on the stage, jumping up and down. I was like, wow, do the CV. You know. We don't worship that way because we don't understand the bad news. The bad news is that you can't save yourself. The bad news is that it is impossible for you to birth yourself. It is impossible for you to say, God, I would like to be saved today. It is impossible. How is it possible? With man, it is impossible. But with God, he makes a way for you. Oh, come on. Y'all are Presbyterian up in this place. I, that, that deserved a praise. That deserved a hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for you have redeemed, for you have done what was impossible. You have cleansed up. You have given me a new heart. You've performed the surgery. You picked me up. I don't know where you were when God found you. I don't know how you were stuck. I don't understand what you were trapped in. I don't understand how you were completely devastated. But when God showed up that moment, you knew that you knew that it was none but God who could rescue, who could redeem, who could free you 
from bondage. You can't do it through your efforts. Accepting the miracles can't save you. Accepting that he's the teacher of Israel cannot make you born again. And I dare say this, you cognitively saying, I believe that you're the Lord, I believe that you're my Savior, that doesn't save you. What saves you is being born again by his Spirit. So let's, let's take an illustration from childbirth. I remember in ninth grade, they, sh- they, they made us watch this video in child development uh, trauma class. It's like, you're going to see how a baby is born. I was like, why? And we watched that video, and some of us fainted. Some of us began to cry. Some of us ran out the classroom. I won't tell you which one was me. All of the above. Matthew Barrett says this, he says, unfortunately, even the most well-meaning Christians today can get the miracle backwards. We think that the new birth is something we must do, but that misses the miracle of it all. It also misses the meaning of the metaphor. Birth is something that happens to us. Birth is something that happens to us, not something we accomplish. How much more with the matters of the Spirit? Do you believe that you need eyes, a new heart, new feet? The only way that you get them is through rebirth in the Spirit. And that's not up to you, and that is why we worship. If you cannot birth yourself, then someone else had to do it for you. So a picture of childbirth, when a baby is born, what is the first sign of life? What's that? Breath. And how do they prove it? Crying. When you cried out to God and said, I accept you, it was because birth had already taken place. Are you with me? A baby crying does not prove does not mean that he's born at that point. It proves birth has taken place. That's how you know you're saved. That's how you know you're saved. It was all God through his spirit. Just like Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. The Apostle Paul emphasizes this in Ephesians chapter chapter 2. He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. I have yet to see a person who's passed out. Ask somebody, can you wake me up? When somebody is dead, a life giver has to, are you with me? It requires God. See, the thing is, this, in, 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 in our Christian theology, we've learned um, uh, a if, if, if false teaching. And those who teach it, I, I don't fault them. They're still our Christian brothers. But the thing is this, that there's no such thing as double-handed salvation where you are reaching up to God and he's reaching down to you and together you're working together. It is not a cooperation with God. It is holy, holy God doing it all. I will give you a new heart. I, are you with me? So that only he can get the praise and the glory for it. He will not share His glory for saving you. Salvation is whose? Belongs to the Lord. Peter picks it up. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused caused us to be born again. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Give thanks to God for his power to save If you, can I say this to you, Damon? If you cannot birth yourself, what makes you think you can grow yourself? 
If you cannot birth yourself, what makes you think you can grow yourself? Oh, I don't need to be in church. Oh, I don't need to, I don't need to, I don't need to, I don't, I don't need discipleship. I don't need, see, that's the, that's the problem with most people. When you're born in Christ, when you're born physically, somebody changes your diaper for a few years. You wet the bed for a few years. I'm just, I'm in that season right now. Praise the Lord. We do laundry every night. The problem with the Christian church, especially in America, is that most of us believe that we're mature when we're spiritual babies. And at most, spiritual teenagers. How do I know, it's, how, how do I know that we're mostly spiritual teenagers? Because the entire Christian church experience is focused on what I want. Teenagers are always focused on Mature people are focused on feeding, finding, nourishing. Are are y'all with me? Is this making sense to y'all? So if you can examine your life and say, where are you in in that birthing process? Are you a baby? Then be humble enough to get your diaper changed. To change your thinking. Are you with me? Are you a spiritual teenager where it's still just focused on, well, I don't know if I'm get, I don't know if I, 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 I don't know if I get anything out of it. Or are you mature? Finding those who need to be birthed, changing diapers. I had an argument with Pauline the other day, and I said to her, I was like, when ever in our experience of the kids have I ever complained about changing a diaper? She said, never, exactly. I'm the better parent. <laughs> I'm in trouble right now. A mature nourisher never complains about taking care of babies and taking care of toddlers and doing the mundane tasks of disciplining spiritual teenagers. Amen. Birth is messy. Can I give you one more thing about that? There's not a single person who was born an adult. Not a single person. So I ask you again, why did you come to church today? Why did you come? Curious? To put God in a box? To hold him where you can manage him? Or was it to be reminded of what he has done in your life? And the encouragement that Jesus gives us is found in the last two verses. It says, and as, was, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... This is what he's telling us to do. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus that through the Son of Man, who descended from heaven, the only one who ascended is the only one who can descend. Are you with me? If he is lifted up, It's giving a metaphor to the cross here. When he is lifted up, look to him and see. Look to him with faith. Just like the Israelites looked at the serpent. As they were dying, as they looked, they were healed. Amen. Amen. Look and live. If you look to the cross upon which Jesus, the Son of God, was lifted, you will live. It's not about how. It's about who. 